Well, if you're new to us today, we've been in the series entitled Rubble, just talking about the broken walls in our lives. Maybe you recognize it, maybe you're standing in the midst of the rubble, and you're beginning to say somebody should do something about it, and perhaps God is stirring your heart to do something about it. And as we've progressed, we've been looking at a a story in the Old Testament about a man named Nehemiah who was presented with literal broken walls, and his heart was stirred to do something about it, and he prayed about it, and he spent months praying about it, seeking God's direction and God's agenda, and then was prepared to move in that. And so where I want to go this morning is, you know, I recognize maybe you're in a place where God has broken your heart about something, you want to do something about the issues in your life, you've been praying about it, and you've been searching God's word, and you've been searching God in prayer to find out what he may have you do, and I think it's crucial, and we need to, we need to pause there for a moment, because as we seek through prayer, Remember that in prayer, we're seeking God's plan, not our plan. We're not going to God saying, God, here's my plan to fix it. Here's what I want to do to fix it. Please help my plan. But saying, God, what is your agenda? How do you want to approach the issues, the broken walls in my life? What do you want me to do? And what I want to talk about this morning is being prepared when God actually gives us the opportunity to do something about it. In the prayer process, there should be some planning. I think a lot of us... We, we feel like, well, in prayer, I don't do any kind of preparation or any planning, and that may end up leading us to a place where the opportunity presents itself to deal with the rubble, but we're not ready to deal with the rubble. It's, it's one thing to forget, you know, you see the trash truck drive by your house, and you realize you didn't take the trash out. That's one thing. It's another thing to have broken walls in your life and an opportunity present itself for you to do something about it, and you weren't ready and you missed that opportunity. That can be just as demoralizing as the broken walls in your life. And so my encouragement to you this morning is that when God moves, be ready to move with him. When God is working in a situation and he's beginning to show you how he wants to rebuild those walls and reshape the situation of your life, through prayer leading up to that, begin prepping yourself to move when God moves in your life. Be ready for that opportunity. Henry Blackaby said this, he said, you cannot stay where you are and go with God at the same time. It's impossible for me to stay where I am at in my life and go where God wants to go with me. And so I need to be ready and prepared. So this morning, that's all we're going to talk about is to move when God is moving in your life. So let's go back to the text. Nehemiah chapter 2, we read this. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I want you to notice this. Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. In order to plan to move when God is moving, I need to first address the fears that are keeping me from moving. And Nehemiah, when he's presented, it's four months he's been praying about the situation in the city of Jerusalem. He's been praying that God would lead and give direction. He's been praying for plans. He's been working through plans through that prayer. And when he's presented with it, when he's standing before the king, all these fears begin to overtake him. Now, it's understandable because, remember, Nehemiah's role was the cupbearer to the king. His job was to make sure the king didn't get poisoned. He would bring food, he would bring wine, he would set all that stuff before the king. So if his countenance does not look good, the king's going to be concerned. Now, for Persian kings, they believed that you should be happy simply being in their presence. To not be happy in the king's presence would be an indication that maybe you're not happy with the way he's running things. Maybe you're not happy with the situation of the, of the community, and that could bode poorly for you, not for the king. But on top of that, when he looks at Nehemiah, he says, you're not ill, so why are you sad? What's going on? He's concerned, because if Nehemiah isn't poisoned as the wine tester, but he's a little off... What might that mean for what he's about to give to me? So there's all these reasons that Nehemiah should be afraid. And he finds himself in that situation. In fact, we read in the book right before it in Ezra, 
The, the request that Nehemiah is about to make is the rebuilding of the city walls in Jerusalem. God, or Artaxerxes had already said through Ezra to stop all work in the city of Jerusalem. So he was about to make a request that was in opposition to what the king had previously said. So there's all these reasons for fears. And I believe when you're stirred by the rubble in your life, perhaps God is moving for you to do something about it, you're going to have fears too. You may have fears that you don't have what it takes. Maybe you have fears that it's impossible. Maybe you fear that the other people in your life that need to be a part of it won't respond the way you hope they would. Maybe you fear that it's just not going to work out in the end. Perhaps you fear rejection or failure or making things worse. There could be all kinds of fears that we're presented with. When we recognize an opportunity to rebuild the walls, but if God is moving, if you've sought God's agenda through prayer and you know that it is God, is, that it is God who's moving, you do not need to be afraid because if God is moving, we have nothing to fear. If God is working in it, he will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Paul wrote this to a young pastor named Timothy. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power love and sound judgment or a sound mind. This, if you are in Christ, the spirit that God has given you is not one of fear. It's one of power, it's one of love, and it's one of a sound mind. To know that if God is moving, that same power that he moved to raise his son from the dead, that same power is in me, and I do not need to fear what it is that I'm about to approach. Some fears may stem from sadness of our hearts, or the brokenness of our hearts. Notice that the king says to him, why are you sad when you're not ill? So there's obviously this perspective of it, he's looking out for whether Nehemiah is ill or not because that could result in something for him. But notice what he says, and this, this statement stood out to me. He says, this can be nothing but sadness of the heart. When I read that, I began asking, I actually sent to my staff, I said, here's a, here's a sermon prep topic for us to discuss. What is the difference between sadness and sadness of the heart? I mean, I think all of us recognize, and we could probably define that. As I started thinking about it, there's a difference for me between I'm sad that the Browns lost Monday night, and I'm sad that I'm losing something very special in my life. There's a difference between that stinks and that hurt. There's a difference between I'm sad that I forgot my lunch today and I'm sad because I feel empty and unfulfilled in my soul. I think that every single one of us understands the difference between being sad and being sad in the heart. And sadness of the heart is the only sadness that will lead us to brokenness to deal with rubble in our lives. That surface sadness isn't going to do it. But when we reach a place where we find sadness in our heart, I want to encourage you, don't allow that sadness to freeze you. Don't allow it to keep you from doing something or allow it to lead you to accept where you are as reality. We can rebuild the rubble. We can rebuild the walls. And we can be where God has called us to be. So accept and understand and, and address the fears that may be presented if God is moving in your life. The second is this, have a plan of action. Nehemiah was afraid, but he prepared for this moment. In his prayer, he was planning. We read this, he says, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad? When the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. He's very wise in his response. Now, I think his response is probably a common response when you're addressing the king of Persia. May the king live forever. But it's important when Nehemiah's role is to protect the king and the king's concern to say, hey, may you live forever. I'm not looking for you to be gone. I need you to know that. So he's really wise in his response to the king, but he begins to address with the king the issues that he needs to deal with. He says, why shouldn't I be sad? The place that represents me and my people is falling apart. And so the king says to him, what do you want? What is it you want? It makes me think of the times when Jesus interacted with people who were blind and says, what do you want? The, the question seems unnecessary because it's evident what they want. 
But is it always for us? Do we really know what it is that we want? Nehemiah gets sort of a blank check here. It's not to say that the king will do anything and everything that he asks for, but this is his opportunity. This is an opportunity to do something about the things that have broken his heart. The king says, what do you want? And Nehemiah was prepared for that moment. If he wasn't, he could have missed it, and the opportunity to fix the brokenness in in his life would have been gone. Notice, he still prays. The king says, what is it you want? Nehemiah says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. Obviously, this was not a four-month-long prayer. The king said, what do you want? He didn't pray for four more months. It was probably a prayer to say, God, listen, I need courage. I need wisdom. It makes me think of what Jesus said to the disciples. Don't worry about what you'll say. I will give you words to say. He was seeking wisdom and direction before he answers the king. The king says, what do you want? And he's praying for that courage. And we need to pray in those moments when the opportunity presents itself as we've been praying all along to get to it. But then be specific In having an action plan, be specific. Notice what he says to the king. He says, I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Notice that when the king says to Nehemiah, what do you want? He doesn't say, he doesn't say, I don't know. He doesn't say, let me think about it. Give me some time. Those responses may have closed the door on the opportunity to rebuild the walls that he sought to rebuild. He had a plan. He had details. In essence, he says to the king, send me. Make sure that you offer support when you send me, and I also want you to fund it. They're big asks. The requests that he makes to, to Artaxerxes are big requests. Not only do I want you to send me and protect me on the journey, I want you to fund the project too. Very detailed in what he says to the king. Proverbs 14.8 says this, The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. Too often we think that faith is a substitute for planning. But faith and planning can go hand in hand. You are not more spiritual for failing to plan. I want you to catch that. You're not more spiritual for failing to plan. And when we, we say, you know what, I'm just stepping out in faith, we do need faith, but it doesn't mean I just willy-nilly decide things and just jump into things. I'm not more spiritual by just jumping at things. Somebody once said this, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You have no plan, no idea of what it is you're trying to accomplish, you'll hit it every time. We, when we fail to plan, we plan to fail. I've said this before, I've said it to students many times, I've said it to young men, I've said it to older men, the reality is most of us don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I want to throw my life away today. Nobody plans to fail, Usually. But the issue is we typically don't plan not to. We don't have a plan going into each day saying, you know, I'm going to fight for what matters. I'm going to make sure I protect myself. I'm going to make sure I put myself in proper situations. When we, plan, when we fail to plan, we plan to fail. I would rather be led than lucky. I'd rather be in the presence of God, seeking him through prayer, seeking his direction, than just hope it kind of works out. Faith and planning are not contradictory. They can go together. So have a plan. Be, be specific. And then consider the cost. For Nehemiah to go back and re- rebuild the walls, it would mean him leaving the comforts of Persia. It would mean a lot of journeying. mean a lot of work. A lot of opposition. A lot of struggle. I think many times our greatest fear is the work that it will involve to rebuild walls. For many of us, 
even if we're not where we want to be, we're not sure we want to do what is needed to be done to get where we know God wants us to be. Again, it's not my plans. It's seeking His and then saying, I'm willing to accept the cost, whatever it takes, to get to where God wants me to be, to get to what God wants to do in my life, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's difficult, even if it's a struggle, shared this before, when God leads, he will provide. And think about the stories all throughout the scripture. When the disciples needed to pay a tax, Jesus says, go down to the pond, fish, you'll find in the fish's mouth some money to pay the tax. I think about the widow in the Old Testament, who only had enough oil to make bread for her and her son, and then they were going to die. And she, instead, she gives to the prophet, and that oil never ran out from then on until the famine was over. I think about Moses, whose mother was provided for, paid, paid to care for her own son by her enemies. When God leads, he will provide. But when you and I choose to do our own thing, we pick up the tab. Like Jonah who said, God, I won't go the direction you want me to go. I'll go my direction. He went down to Joppa, and he paid the fare. He picked up the tab. When I choose to say, God, I will not go the direction you want me to go, I will have to pay the cost. But when I go his direction, he will provide. Third, be patient, but don't procrastinate. Nehemiah had waited for four months. He had prayed for four months. He didn't act upon anything for four months other than seeking God's direction and God's plans. But when the opportunity presented itself, he did not hesitate. It says, I want to go back to a little detail in the midst of it. It says, then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? Very specific. And it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. If we do not have deadlines, if we do not set a time, we are then presented with the reality of just not moving. What we do is we just push things off and push things off. If all we do is push deadlines, we have no deadlines, we don't actually move. I read a poem by a woman named Gloria Peitzer. I I adjusted a little bit to make it more... uh, common to our language. She says this, procrastination is my sin. It brings me nothing but sorrow. I know that I should stop it. In fact, I will tomorrow. Many of us, we just keep pushing off the things that we know God is asking us to do. I'll get at it later. One of my favorite TED Talks is a TED Talk by a man named Tim Urban. And in it, in a very comical way, he expresses how a college student could push off their syllabus for day after day after day, week after week after week, to finally, the night before, they, they slam out a 50-page paper and hand it in. How's that happen? Because there's a deadline. It's not the best process. I encourage you young college students, it's not the best process. Get your work done earlier. But we do it and can do it because we're presented with a deadline. If I don't get it done by this point, I'm going to lose the grade. I may have to retake the class. But what he goes on to express is there's a greater issue in life because there's certain things that are more broad and we think we don't have deadlines for, but we do have a deadline. No, No pun intended deadline. We assume that there's tomorrow. And so when we say, I'll put it off till tomorrow, we're not sure we'll have a tomorrow. And so there's a lot of things in our life that we put off that there will come a deadline to. And as we procrastinate, we miss the opportunity to rebuild the rubble of our lives. Don't be hasty. Be patient through prayer. But move when you sense God moving. I'll say this, maybe you're new to us, maybe you're new to faith, you're checking things out, maybe you're at home, and you're just kind of curious. Maybe God is moving in your heart to come back to him. 
You've heard about Jesus and what he did on the cross for your sins. You heard that he came back to life to give you new life. And you're curious, but you're just not sure. You buy it, and you're not sure that you can accept that truth. I do want to say that there is a deadline even to God's gracious window. There's a deadline to faith. There's coming a day, either through your own journey, where you come to the end of your life, or through the journey of God's story, where he ends time and begins our entrance into eternity, where the deadline of faith will end. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to accept the invitation that Jesus has offered into the kingdom of God. Through belief in him. Don't put it off. If God's moving in you, if he's stirring in you, respond today to what Jesus has offered. And finally, anticipate opposition and problems. You know, Nehemiah asked for letters to be sent with him because he knew there would be opposition. There were people around the area of Jerusalem, there were enemies around the area of Jerusalem who were not happy about them rebuilding. And as you read through, if you're to read through all of Nehemiah, you'll find that they, they constantly find new tactics. They first try to stop it through force. Then they mock them, and then they just try any tactic they could find to stop the rebuilding process. They do not want to see their enemies find protection to be restored. Can I tell you that you and I have an enemy too? And he does not want to see you restored. We have an enemy in the devil who is opposed to the rebuilding of the broken walls in your life. He's not comfortable with you picking up the rubble and restoring what God wants for you. He doesn't want that with your spouse, he doesn't want that with your kids, he doesn't want that with your thoughts. And he doesn't want that with your heart. He will fight against that at every turn. And he will use every tactic he has in his book to stop restoration in your life. He wants things to remain broken. He wants you to remain broken. You have an enemy. And he wants you to stay broken. But here's what we read. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said, Dear friends, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if there's opposition. Don't be surprised if there's attack. Don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal that comes, comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Don't be surprised that you have an enemy who's going to stop things or try to stop things. He would go on in that same letter to say, we have an enemy who's like a roaring lion seeking whomever he can devour. He's not picky. Whomever. He wants to destroy. And he doesn't want to see broken walls rebuilt. That Paul would say this, put on the full armor of God to stand against the schemes of the devil. In essence, be prepared for a fight. If God has stirred in your heart and you've been through prayer seeking a plan and now the opportunity presents itself to find restoration for the brokenness that's in your life, be prepared for a fight. Because your enemy does not want that. He does not long for you to be restored. He wants you to stay broken. He wants your realities to stay broken. And he wants those around you to stay broken. But... We have one who has overcome the devil. We have one who is greater and who can move the hearts of kings and has overcome the world. Nehemiah asked the king of Persia, the greatest empire at that time, to not only send him but fund it, and the king says, sure. Who made that happen? A God who is greater than any enemy that we face in the rubble that we're trying to fix. God is moving. and His plans will prevail. I just wonder, are you ready to move with him? What's holding you back? 
What's keeping you stuck? Nehemiah says something significant after making this request to the king and getting his approval. He says, so I went. For many of us, we may be stirred. Our hearts are stirred by the brokenness of our lives. We may even be praying about the brokenness of our lives. But it's one thing to be stirred. It's another thing to go. We could pray about it. We could talk about it. We can plan around it. But eventually, somebody has to do something about the brokenness in your life. Somebody has to move. I think that somebody is you. I think that somebody's me. Nehemiah says he would move. I remember hearing something years ago from Howard Hendricks. I think he was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, we have to have goals. Where is it that I want to get? If I don't know where I'm going, I'm probably never going to get there. But in order to reach my goals, I need a plan. What's the plan? What are the steps? What are the things that need to happen to reach that goal? But just having a plan will not get me to my goal. I need to also have a schedule. When am I going to enact these sets of plans? When am I going to do this? When am I going to do that? When's this going to happen? But even that doesn't get me to my goal. In the end, I need the discipline to move. I need the discipline to keep the schedule, to fulfill the plan, to reach the goal. And if I sense that God is moving in my life, I need to be ready to move with him. If he is moving in you now, ask that he would empower your feet to move, your hands to move, your checkbook to move, your lips to move, whatever it is that needs to move to rebuild the rubble that is broken in your lives. If God's moving, move with him. Let's pray. Father, I I ask that you would give us clarity to to recognize through your spirit when you are moving in our lives and our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would suppress the attacks of the enemy, the deception of the enemy, the darkness of the enemy that would cloud us from seeing what it is that you want to do, that would fill our minds with reasons why we can't do that, fears, fears of what might occur, fears of what may never happen, fears of what we might experience if we take that step. Lord, I pray that your spirit would eliminate those lies from the devil and would give clarity to the plans that you want to accomplish. That when we know, according to your word and according to pursuit of you through prayer and the study of your word, when we know what it is that you want to do, Lord, that we would say, God, give me the strength to move. I sense you moving. I see you moving all around me. Lord, give me the strength to join you where you're moving. Defeat my fears. Defeat my enemies. And give me the strength to accomplish what I could not accomplish on my own. Father, I pray if you're moving in someone's heart today, if they see the testimony of Jack and the simplicity of saying, I love God because he loves me. I love Jesus because he loves me. And they've been wrestling with that reality of accepting it. But yet you're stirring in their heart, Lord. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray that today as you move in their hearts, they would move with you. And say, Lord, I accept your invitation into the kingdom. I recognize that I am a sinner incapable of restoring my relationship with the holy God. But I recognize that the righteous one, Jesus Christ, paid for my sin on the cross. And he offers me new life through his resurrection. He changes my identity. He makes me a new creation. He bought me back. But I believe in that. Through that belief, I ask for your spirit to indwell me and for your spirit to lead me in your plans, not mine. I pray that we would pray that this morning in Jesus' name.